Ephesians chapter 3. Let me pull that up here. And uh, no, in fact, I'm going to do this. Uh, let me let me try. Let's see here. Uh, there we go. Ephesians chapter 3. And um, like I say, I went back in time in my little time machine upstairs and I listened to uh, the last. By the way, let me tell let me tell everybody what, what happened last Sunday. Uh, um, yeah, um, it was I was only a week out from having gallbladder surgery and uh the day after the surgery was probably the worst. I mean, I, had, I all that air they pump in you was all right here on my right side. It was killed. It was like a thousand knives inside of you, stabbing you from the inside out. And I that was all day long. Finally, one o'clock Wednesday morning, I tried to lay down in bed because every every single position I could put my body in was hurting me, and I found. I could lay on my right, on my left side, and I finally went to sleep. When I woke up Wednesday morning, uh, most of that was gone, and I was thankful for that. I, people prayed for me, I prayed for me, and uh, hallelujah, God answered the prayer. So Sunday, uh, Friday I went, like I say, we had relatives come in from Atlanta and Little Rock, and, and I went around with them uh, doing a little shopping there in Kimswick. Friday and then uh, Saturday we had a big family get together uh, downstairs and uh, you know just active with everybody Sunday morning had service church service and everything and then we we're going to do communion Sunday afternoon and about 20 minutes before the service Derek saw saw me he was like you want me to call an ambulance or what because I had just come through that door and I, I had pulled something in where my gallbladder used to be I felt something like pull or something like that and I mean I was in severe pain and poor Derek I thought he was gonna pass out from my pain and uh, I got to about there and I turned around walk back didn't I Derek and by the time I got here I had my phone out he was wanting to call somebody I said no I got so I pulled Lisa up and I'm holding the phone and I said, Lisa, get up here. And I heard her say, John, you better come with me. Okay. So anyway, I made it to my desk and I'm, I can't sit. I can't stand standing nothing. And I'm like, we, we got to have communion service. I don't know what to do because I can't do nothing. I'm in severe pain. And they helped me sit down in my chair in my office and I'm like leaning to this side here because everything else hurt and I'm like invalid now can't do nothing so John's standing there I said John see this black book here on my desk yeah I said that's a minister's manual it has every service that we as Baptists would do if I would, and I said I was given that when I first uh, was ordained to preach. It's got funeral services, weddings in it. It's got child dedications. It's got all kind, of, everything but circumcisions in it. It's got all everything. It's got communion services in it. And I said, there's nothing in the Bible that says you can't conduct a communion that it has to be ordained bishop or pastor. And I said, there's not even anything in the Bible that says who can baptize. And I said, so. Can you do the service? And so he's nervous. Man, bless his heart. He's looking at that manual. I said, just read what's on there. It's all you got to do is read what's on there. And, you know, we give out the stuff, give out the bread first, then the wine, and then leave me with one. So I'm in my office doing this while y'all are out here doing it. And that's, that's never happened before. So it's a first for everything. Um... And I hurt, I hurt there, it got better, but I hurt there most of the week. And like Thursday, Lisa's asking me, Go, why don't you call the surgeon? And I said, sweetie, you know, we're fixing to leave tomorrow. I got way too much to do today to sit at a doctor's office for hours 
most of this day when all he's going to tell me is, well, you had surgery, so you hurt from the surgery. I'll see you on Tuesday because I got an appointment, a two-week follow-up. And uh, so it actually started getting better, and uh, we took the long way to Norwood. Huh? Did you go down 67 to 60, or did you go back road? 21? Oh, yeah, you did, because 21 runs into 60. So anyway, yeah, it is this. Um, but anyway, we, we were looking for places like antique shops and stuff like that. There are none. We found one, maybe. But anyway, uh, so by the time I, we got there, I was wore out, and I was, I was starting to hurt then, and we ate. They asked me, if, did you get a list of things you can eat or you can't eat from the doctor? I said, no, but I'm making my own list of things that I probably am not going to try too much anymore. So we didn't get to go to the service Friday night, but by, by yesterday, uh, I was in pretty good shape. Today I am. I've got the, where the stitches are right here. There's a little infection there. And it's probably because it's right there. And my shirt always rubs against it there. And that's probably what happened. So he'll probably give me an antibiotic Thursday and it'll be over with. All right. I don't foresee dying any time this week. All right. But you never foresee dying. So anyway. All right. Ephesians chapter 3. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And ask him to give us light now, because I mean, I'm going to drop something on you. If I get to it tonight, I'm going to drop something on you, and I'm going to build you up to it. And then I'm going to, I'm going to show you something in 1 Corinthians 14 that I never noticed it being this way before. But it, to me, it makes better sense than 1 Corinthians 14 has ever made. Okay? And uh, you don't have to agree with anything I say about it, okay? Because I don't know that I'm right yet, but let's pray. Father, I, I come before you tonight, and I thank you, God, for this Bible. I love it. And I love, Lord, you just showed me the order that even this word mystery is in. It's in an order. And I'm following that order, and I'm seeing, God, how you have set things or arranged things for our learning, for our understanding. And Father, I love you. I, I love this book. And Lord, uh, you know me better than anybody. And you have... I was curiously wrought, Lord, when you made me. And you made my mind and how it works. And sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm way off. And I just wait for you to correct me. And Lord, you've been faithful to me and I love you for that. And so Lord, I'm asking you to guide us all. These people here tonight, those watching, have as much right to know what this Bible is saying as I do. I am not an expert. I'm not their authority. The Bible is. So Father, be our authority tonight. Be our final and, and last authority and we submit our minds and our hearts to you tonight in trying to understand uh, what Peter said are some things hard to understand. Uh, but Lord, we're living in a time now where knowledge is being increased. And so, Father, maybe some things, Lord, will uh, be known uh, as we approach the day, uh, the evil day where you called us to stand. And then we approach the day of your coming. So bless us, Lord, tonight. Open our eyes and uh, close our mouths, Father, when they need to be closed. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. All right, I got, I got two amens on that, so God's going to shut my mouth when it's time to shut up. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, Paul said in verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Uh, I just like how that's worded. And um, Pastor Kelly preached a message years ago, and I don't have a copy of it, but it was called Chain to the Chariot. And he noticed that Paul referred to himself not a prisoner for Jesus Christ. There's a difference, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. 
And uh, if you look at Acts, Paul was captured. Uh, Paul was at war with Jesus and was going to fight the soldiers in the battle. That's what he was going to Damascus to do. And he was captured by the enemy, Christ, and made his prisoner. And this is not the only time Paul says a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And the four comes in later. The prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. That comes in after he says, I'm a prisoner. Uh, who are you a prisoner of? I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's just, to me, it's curious how, how the Holy Ghost led Paul to write that. He could have, he, we see here in this verse, he could have written it, a prisoner for, you know, like the cause and sake of Jesus Christ. I was arrested because I was preaching in Jesus' name. And that's, that's not what he says. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, for your cause, for your aid, for your benefit, for your edification. And remember that I said that. Everything Paul did was for everybody else. Very little was for himself. He made that clear. He would go someplace and refuse to take any offerings from the people that he preached to. He established himself as a tent maker in every place that he went so that he could earn his own bread and not have people say, well, you just come into town to take our money and now he's running off and leaving and on and on. And Paul never wanted it. So everything he did was for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ and for those who would hear it. So now, having established that, he says in verse 2, if you have heard of the dispensation, the grace of the grace of God, the grace of God was dispensed to him for a purpose, which is given me to you word. There it is again. I'm for the Gentiles and this was given to me for what purpose? So that I could hold on to it and say, I'm the only one that's got it and you don't have it. I'm going to sell it to you for your love offering of seventy-five ninety-five. No, he said, I have it. It was given to me to be sent in your direction to you word is like forward. Okay. Uh, verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto two groups of people, his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, I, I, I can't remember, I think I've already dealt with the issue some of these hyper dispensationalists say that only Paul had this mystery. Peter didn't have it. James, John, they didn't know what it was. It was only revealed to Paul and Paul's the only one that had it. That's a lie. That's stupid. That's a lie. And the Bible clearly contradicts that. Not just here, but in 1 Corinthians 15. Very clearly says that the mystery was revealed unto, number one, his holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit. Now, uh, the, and verse 6 gives us a, an idea of what, that, what part of the mystery is. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. So it's not just a Jewish religion anymore. It's not just, it's not just Judaism. It is a religion that is for every man, woman, child on the earth if they will believe. And it is also for Israel, for any Jew that will believe. Okay? So, but let's go back up to verse 3. Now let me explain that a minute using what Paul said in Galatians. He said in verse 3, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now, we know that Paul did not discover this mystery by his reading and his knowledge of the words of the Old Testament. He says clearly here... Um, Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. And in another place, he says it a little bit differently. And we're going to get to that in a minute. Uh, but what happened was, Paul said this in Galatians. Uh, in Galatians 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach. The Apostle Paul... the when he, when he was captured by Christ on the Damascus Road, he goes to 
Damascus. He's baptized. Um, at first, they don't want to. They don't want to trust him. They, what? You're here to kill us. Now you're like pretending to be one of us. But God reveals to them that this is my chosen vessel. I've chosen him. He's my guy. Don't worry about it. And so, once Paul became established, or Saul, as he was known then, once Saul became, once it became established among the believers that he was truly, in fact, on their side, and was now saved. Then, Paul says in Galatians, I didn't go to Peter. I didn't go to John. I didn't go to James. I didn't sit under their ministry. I didn't go to their churches. I didn't listen to their tapes. I didn't, I didn't watch their podcasts. I didn't do anything. Fourteen years, he says... He went to, he, he was alone, and Jesus himself taught Paul everything. It's interesting that if you include Hebrews, Paul is gone 14 years, and he writes 14 books of the New Testament. Okay? Clearly, clearly, the most proficient writer of the Bible the Apostle Paul okay clearly because I mean you see the mystery revealed in the Gospels you see it revealed uh, somewhat by James by Peter by John Jude a little but by and large Paul is the one who is telling you everything that there you need to know then now we can, with that knowledge in mind, then we, you and I, and those who believe, Paul did, now we can go back to the Old Testament and we can see it everywhere. We can see it in the types and the shadows and the stories. That's why most of the Old Testament is history. And it has to be reliable history, or if because if it didn't happen, then the Bible's wrong and our understanding of the mystery is wrong. So anyway, that's why he said in verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Is that he literally did not receive his doctrines from any of the other apostles. No prophets came to him. Saul, I've got a word of prophecy for you. Oh, God's telling me this. Oh, I had a dream last night. Oh, you were in it and I saw it. He had none of that. Somehow, we're not really told how, but somehow Jesus taught Paul directly to his ear or to his mind or it's not out of the realm of possibility that Jesus appeared in the room that Paul was sitting in and said Paul write this down you're gonna to need to know this you're gonna to need to remember it it's not outside we don't know that we don't know how it was done we just know that Paul said I did not I conferred with no other Apostle I didn't go and hear from anybody else. I heard this. I got this from Jesus Christ. And so what he's saying is, when I give you my doctrine and my gospel, it came, with, it came from Jesus Christ directly. It therefore has His authority on it. You either believe it and can be saved, or you deny it and are doomed. Your choice. Because that's what he's saying. He's saying, he, he, he oftentimes, in a letter, he always starts out, Paul an apostle, and um, sometimes he has to really emphasize the idea that he is, in fact, an apostle, which means that he has authority. He has been given, him along with the other apostles, were given earthly authority over the doctrines of this New Testament age that we're living in. They are the ones, and we have recorded for us, like I said, uh, you know, John, James, and, and Peter, and, and Jude, and these others, we have their record recorded for us, and they're all in agreement as to what the mystery is, what the gospel is, what the truth is, what the doctrines should be. They come by authority from Jesus Christ. He picked these men in person. By the way, that's another thing. Anybody calls himself an apostle now, they're lying. Or 
they don't understand what an apostle really is. I know that term is misused in Kenya. Misapplied, misused. And I, and I want to try to help that if I can. But the bottom line is, there are no more apostles anymore. We have all, all the apostle I need right here. Okay? So now, then he writes, he talks about this mystery. So, uh, I'm not going to go back over this. You get your Bible out and read it, or you can watch what I posted. It was at the beginning of May. It's been a while. Uh, so, where we left off was Romans 11, 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is having to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. I want to go to Romans 16. And let's look at the context of it. Uh, we see here that he is closing out the letter. And uh, something that you'll see, you, can, you can see it in a couple of other epistles that Paul wrote. But here, he, he's establishing his authority over the church by establishing those who know him. Because you read, um, like in verse 21, Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipater, my kinsmen, salute you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle. Tertius was, the word we learned in Bible college was amanuensis. A-M-A-N-U-E-N-S-I-S. -E amanuensis. And basically is a word that means a personal secretary. In other words, Paul himself, probably because of his eyes, remember, in Galatians, he said, you see with what large letter I write unto you with my own hand. He's like got one of these big lead pencils. You remember those in little, little school, you know, and you wrote big letters? And that's what he's doing because he can't see. But he, you, but he does that as sort of his signature. In, I think it's in Galatians is where he does it. And here, he's got um, Tertius writing this for him as he's dictating it. Remember, the Holy Ghost, the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And as Paul is speaking, these words are the words of the Holy Ghost coming through him. And Tertius is writing them down. But he says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Gaius, mine host, and the whole church saluteth you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you. Quartus, a brother. He's, met, he's dropping names. You guys know Quartius, don't you? Or Quartus. Yeah, he's where we get our oil from. <laughs> yeah, we know Quartus. Well, he knows us. Go, go ask him about us. You guys know Tim, Timotheus, don't you? You know Sosa Potter. Uh, you know Tertius. You remember Gaius? He hosted us. He let us stay in his house the whole time we were there. So he's dropping names to these Romans so they know that he knows them. Because they live in Rome. And in Rome is not the safest place in the world right now to be a Christian. Okay? Rome is the city where, I can't remember who it was, Nero or somebody, one of them, took their heads off of them and put them all up and down the streets, hanging off buildings and on posts and stuff like that. Put, oh, i got to remember, I want to get this right. There was something about one of the Caesars, I think, using their skulls for a candle holder or a lamp holder or something like that. And it was a message to all the citizens of Rome, I'm not tolerating this. Now, it's interesting. You could be practically any kind of pagan you wanted to be in Rome. You just couldn't be a Christian. Go figure. Same in North Korea, China. So anyway, he says all that. Then he says, um, verse 24, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. But he's not done. He says, Now to him that is of power to establish you. Establish means to establish. And that, that Latin prefix, S-T-A, S-T-E, or S-T-O. Anytime you see that in a word, usually it's going to mean something that doesn't move. Statue. Doesn't move. A statute. 
is a law that's not changed. It doesn't move. Okay? Um, a star is static. There's another word, in the night sky. We stop at stop signs. You must be careful of steps because they don't move. See how that prefix works. So establish, when you stab somebody, they don't move anymore. Okay, I made that up anyway. Uh, so he said, um, now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. In other words, God has the power to fix your life and make your walk with Christ permanent. Do you believe that? I do. He has the power to do it. He makes it permanent. He has the power to establish you according to my gospel. And the preaching of Jesus Christ. Now, the preaching of Jesus Christ is according to the revelation of the mystery. Now, again, here's Paul talking about, and he says it there in Ephesians 3.3, 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. This is how Paul got it. Again, he didn't confer with any other apostles. He heard it personally from Jesus Christ himself. So he said, now this revelation, this mystery, deliberately, there's, Paul's saying there's a reason why God waited until a sorry sack of nothing showed up named Saul of Tarsus. There's a reason why God waited until this time to reveal this mystery. And here's why. He said it was kept secret since the world began. And this is what he says here back in Ephesians. But now is made manifest. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Now, if I, rem I think I may have covered this last Wednesday night, so I'm not going to stay much on this. But the bottom line is, and I, I know I said this last time we were here because I, I listened to it. You don't believe anybody who says, God, is, God has taught me some new thing. Well, where is it? I want to read it. In the, you won't find it in the Bible because it's not there. God gave it to me personally. And I think God has called me to give it to everybody else. Don't fall for that from, any, from me. Don't fall for it. If it comes out of my face, don't believe it. Don't fall for it. Cut me off. Tell me to get out. Okay? And you're not going to listen anymore because I'm trying to give you some private revelation. Okay? So, um, now, go to 1 Corinthians 2. Where's my mouse? And this is why, this is why it was all kept secret. God never revealed to Moses, David, Isaiah, Ezekiel, none of those guys. God never revealed what he, was, what he was truly going to do. Now, he didn't lie in the Old Testament. He concealed it. He concealed it in types and shadows. That's how he hid it. When we now, knowing the New Testament, when we go back to the Old Testament and we look at those types... I ought to show them what I... Hmm. I'm not going to get to what I was... I won't do it. The, I'm going to upload a video, uh, the first part of what I said yesterday. And if you have not seen it yet, yeah. Artificial intelligence is the devil. I'm telling you, okay, it, it is, yeah, even Elon Musk said it. All right, so let's, let's look at this. But anyway, God had to keep it secret, and here's why. So Paul said, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. In other words, 
the things that you and I talk about, about Christ, and if I, if I mention, you know, resurrection day, if I mention the rapture, you guys all know what I'm talking about. Because you've read the Bible, you've heard preachers talk about it, you've learned the faith, and so you know the lingo. Believe it or not, most people in this world, in this country especially, that are lost, have no idea what anything we're talking about is about. That they don't have a clue. Okay? And it's funny to hear people, like on documentary shows and stuff like that, try to explain things like the apocalypse or the end of times or the rapture because generally they get it wrong. Generally they do. They have no idea. Okay, what did they, they may have tried to look it up somewhere and that's it. But anyway, so he said, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. And here's what he's saying, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. Why was it so secret? Why couldn't God let it out what he was going to do and what this mystery is? What, what was so, and I'll say this, apparently still is. Apparently there are aspects of it that are still hidden from devils. And the only way I can explain that is like the first time my dad took me deer hunting, he puts orange on me. And dad, what is this? Uh, so you don't get shot. Well, dad, I'm like sticking out like a sore thumb here. I'm blaze orange. The deer are going to see me a mile away. Deer can't see orange. I didn't believe him. I can see orange. They got eyes. I didn't believe them. Apparently they can't see orange. It's hidden from them. Their eyes cannot see this color orange on me. We can. And we're supposed to. Amen. It's a good idea. But they can't see it. It's hidden from them. And there are devils that even though Satan is wiser than Daniel, his wisdom and his beauty have been corrupted. And so he can't understand certain things, even when they're spoken plainly, the way Paul said. For we speak plainly and not as Moses. There's another clue to the Old Testament. So why was it kept hidden? He said, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world under our glory. In other words, the whole mystery thing and the whole purpose of God in this world was figured out before the creation. God didn't change his mind as he went along and saw how bad everything was. It was done before the world was ever made. And so he says, which none of the verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew. By princes he means what? Spirits, principalities. They not even these angelic beings could figure it out. He says, because if they would have known it, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The crucifixion of Christ was supposed to happen. It was meant to happen. It had to happen and it was going to happen and it did happen. And nothing can change it. Nothing could have changed it. The devil didn't see it coming. Remember, who initiated this whole crucifixion thing? Satan did by entering into Judas Iscariot. That has never been seen in the Bible where Satan physically entered into a human being. But he did Judas. In that sense, one of the reasons why Judas is called the son of perdition by Jesus, the son of perdition is the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2, is by Satan entering in Judas, Satan the dragon is giving him his power, his seat, and great authority. So Judas now is going to be the one who makes sure that Jesus gets killed and we're going to do it on a cross so Judas betrays him 30 pieces of silver the Romans capture him 
I'm sure Satan's working in Pilate. He's working in Herod. He's working all of this stuff. And he is following Jesus right up to the cross. How do we know? Psalm 22 tells us that Jesus was surrounded by these spirits. Okay? Bull, strong bulls of Bashan have encompassed me about. And he's, tell, he's talking about devils. They're just, they're all around him. And it's like, can you imagine? We can't, but being on the cross, suffering the physical pain of crucifixion, the torture of being strangled for nine hours, on top of it, bearing the sins of the entire world, then having all the devils around you, not only the people mocking you, but all the future inhabitants of hell mocking you all at the same time. And Jesus probably knows this. What a Savior. Amen? So, the purpose of God not uh, revealing what He reveals plainly in the four Gospels, what He reveals plainly by Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 15, not only the resurrection, but the Gospel. He said that, you know, the Gospel basically is Christ died, rose again on the third day, uh, intercedes on, for on, on our behalf, His blood covers our sins, and so on. You see blood here, but it's not Christ's blood, it's a lamb's blood. And so, on Jesus' 30th birthday, well, even before that, you start getting a hint. John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Okay? And if you were clued into God then, you were going, I just read that. In, the, in Exodus. I just read that. Or that was in the synagogue last Sabbath day. I heard the rabbi read that. That's the lamb? Whoa. And there were people following him, I think, that followed him all the way to the end of their life and they're in heaven now. Um, so anyway, but it wasn't revealed, not even a word, until the day Jesus was born and the angels then came and proclaimed, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. And all the things that the angels foretold, they're announcing the birth of the Savior of the world right there. And what, what starts to take shape right after that? As soon as the angels announce it, as soon as Herod hears of it, what happens? What happens? Yeah, you with the beard. What did Herod do? He killed two years old and younger because it had, two years had passed and he's like, I got to find this king and we we'll kill him because I'm the king. And so Satan had, at the, I think from the moment the angels announced it, now the cat's out of the bag. And Satan then starts trying to kill Jesus Christ. Before that, he doesn't know who to kill. For 400 years, God hasn't said a word to anybody. None of the prophets, nothing. And now, here in Matthew, boom. John the Baptist, we have the angels announcing it. Then John the Baptist coming 30 years later saying, this is the Lamb of God. And then you have Satan setting up the death of Jesus Christ and finally has him killed. And he's thinking, now I can have the kingdom. Now it's mine. Because Jesus taught that in a parable. This is what it was about. Kill the king's son and we'll get the kingdom. It didn't work out that way, did it? And yet, the plan of God. That was the whole plan of God. So he says, Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen. Now, this is an Old Testament phrase, an Old Testament prophecy. Because in the Old Testament, I had not seen, and ears had not heard. The old, what this verse is pronounced... Some look at this verse and say, boy, the Bible says we can't even, our eyes have not, cannot even see what God has prepared for us. That is not what this says. Read it. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And he means the gospel. In other words, the Old Testament wrote this and it proclaims that as of the Old Testament days, 
God has not revealed this to any man on the earth. Anybody. But, look at verse 10. God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. So, is it now a mystery? Is even the appearance of heaven a mystery to us? No. Because John gave an accurate description of the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. He wrote it down exactly the way God showed it to him. So now not even that is a mystery to us anymore. Amen. So he says, but God revealed them to us by his spirit for the spirit searcheth all. There's that phrase. All things, yea, the deep things of God. And that's what I like. Now, I don't mind wading in shallow water every now and then. But I like to swim deep, figuratively speaking. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him. So, like Matthew and Chris and you guys, I mean, I get you. Right? Because I'm a man. Okay? I get you guys. We speak the same language. Women, they don't understand us. Amen, Roy? See, I get you, brother. Okay? But, in fairness to them, we have no idea what women are saying either. That takes a woman know a woman right anyway move on God uh, for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God so you cannot discern these things physically you cannot discern them this is why this is why even lost people can read the King James Bible and not get a, a thing out of it not understand anything of what I just told you Alexander Scorby as far as I know died lost Okay, best reader of the King James ever died a lost man. Isaac Asimov writes a commentary on the entire King James Bible. Doesn't believe a word of it. Doesn't even believe in God, but he writes a commentary on the Bible. What does that tell you? That you can read the whole Bible cover to cover and do an in-depth study on it. And because you are not discerning or have the Spirit of God in you, you don't understand this. You, you don't get it. So, verse 12. Now... Now, in this time, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that... How much does it cost to learn these things? For your love offering. $79.95. No, that are freely given to us of God. This is one of the verses God used to change my mind about selling stuff years ago. Which things also we speak... Not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. That's why you cannot lead people to Christ with man's wisdom. It won't work. You're not leading them to Christ. You must use God's wisdom. That which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Spiritual things in Ephesians, spiritual things in Amos and Jeremiah, and on and on and on and on. So that's how we understand the mystery because the Spirit of God has shown us this. I, I mentioned this uh, yesterday. I heard Brother Reg uh, give his testimony years ago in a message. And he said he was saved the night that God called him to preach. It was all happening in one night. And he said, I didn't go to seminary. I didn't go to Bible college. I didn't do anything like that. He said, I just started reading the Bible. I knew I had to read the Bible. So I started reading the Bible. And he said, before too long, God started showing me Things in the New Testament were in the Old Testament. And things in the Old Testament, I could see them clearly now in the New Testament. And he said, God started hooking things together for me. And that's how he learned. And, I'm going, and I said to his church, he got it right. He didn't learn this in Bible college. The Holy Ghost taught him. He said he learned it from the Word of God. Okay? So the natural man can, uh, natural man receive it, not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned understand this now but he that is spiritual judgeth all things yet he himself judge is judged of no man for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him that's an Old Testament verse but we have the mind of Christ not that we instruct God but what Christ knows we can know probably can't 
retain all of it. But it's right here written for us in black and white. Plain English. Amen. Now that's important what I said. I know it's a little past time, but let me... Let me give you a little teaser. First Corinthians 14. And I'm not, I'm not ready to pick it up yet. I sat and pondered it this afternoon. I, I just... I think I've discerned something. I'm not giving out new revelations. Nothing like that. It's not anything that somebody else couldn't figure out. Because it's fairly simple. But let's look at 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14 is probably, without a doubt, the most controversial chapter in the entire Bible. As I would say especially among churches and denominations. This chapter and this chapter alone is what divides many churches into different and various denominations. And it's all based on that church's idea of what tongues are, and what unknown tongues are, and so on. And, and how they are performed. Did they, did they cease, like Paul said? Did they, in fact, cease because something better came along, which is what I believe? Um, or do people still, when you see Kenneth Copeland jabbering in tongues up on the stage, big show off that he is, is he under the direction of the Holy Ghost? Is he speaking words from the Holy Ghost, directly from the Holy Ghost, and nobody knows it? Or what? What's happening? There are, and I'm going to say... We're not, I, there are some churches, we had a pastor here several years ago that came by to see us. He visited on a Wednesday night. He is from a, a Pentecostal type church, but he said, and I know some other churches that do it this way, Pentecostal, they follow the exact reading of, this, of 1 Corinthians 14. If tongues are done in their church, it's one person and then another one. Possibly a third, but no more than that. And it's never a woman. Never a woman. Because it says right after that, let your women keep silent. We haven't dismissed yet, so hang on, okay? Um, so anyway, it's not. It, it, they follow the scripture. And though I disagree with their idea of what the unknown tongue is, um, they may disagree with me on giants, okay? So I leave them be. Okay, they use King James, hold only the King James, and I'm, I'm okay with that. So it's not my place to judge. I'm wrong about things. I'm probably wrong about this one. But let's read the first few verses, 1 Corinthians 14, and let's see what comes up. He just taught us in 1 Corinthians 13 about charity. And he said... In verse 8 of chapter 13, charity never faileth, but whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. That's why I believe what I believe. So he says now, he starts out in chapter 14 with follow after charity, which is God's love. It is the uh, unselfish love that you give. Courtney, it's the love that you give to your children. I've seen it. It's the love you give to your children that is a sacrificial love. You don't have to have your children say, thank you and I love you, mommy, every time you feed them. But you feed them. And why? Yeah, they'll, they'll die if you don't. Okay? Or they'll get taken away. So you don't, you, so you feed them. You take care of them, you do it and you love them. And th they may not say I love you every day, but you're still going to do it. And that's the kind of love he's talking about. And that's the love that we're supposed to have for everybody in this church and everybody online and then everybody out here. An unceasing, self, unselfish love. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. And he now has just elevated prophesying to the top of the list, which is preaching. Top of the list. 
undoubtedly in this chapter prophesying is top of the list verse 2 for he that speaketh now watch this he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God for no man understandeth him Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh what go ahead okay now Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries now who is this man You understand what I'm asking you? I don't know if you do. Because I don't know if I can say it yet. He that... Let's say that a man walked in our church. We don't know who he is. We don't know where he came from. And he comes in here. And he starts speaking, Callie, in a language... That we have not only not ever heard, we don't even, we can't even perceive the accent. You know, we can tell if somebody is from France, why? They have accent. China, accent. Philippines, very thick accent, very thick Philippines. Kenya, when I hear black people speak with an accent, I always ask them where they're from. And sometimes I'll get a hit. I'm from Kenya. Oh, cool. Let me tell you. And, you know, we have a good conversation. But a guy comes in a church. Nobody knows where he came from. Nobody knows who he is. And he speaks in this language that I mean nobody has ever heard this language anywhere at any time in any place. That is the true meaning of what an unknown tongue is. It's unknown. Who knows it? Nobody. Nobody does. It's unknown. Now, some of you may know where I'm going. Turn to Deuteronomy 28. That's where I'm going. Now you know. And you can say, you know, I was just going to say Deuteronomy 28. You can say that now and be like the coolest person in the whole church. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 28, look at um, verse 33. Look at verse 32. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. Who? Look at verse 33. The fruit of thy land and all thy labor shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up. Now, I'm going to ask you a million dollar question. What nation is there that we don't know? Huh? There you go. That's what I'm thinking. Okay? We know every nation now in this world because we live in the days when knowledge shall be increased. Okay, so there's things, it's just like the DNA thing I taught yesterday. We now know what Psalm 139, 16 is talking about because we know what DNA is. But 75 years ago, nobody could know what Psalm 139, 16 was talking about. Nobody could. Nobody could discern that the Old Testament and New Testament were the two latter rungs of DNA and the four Gospels were the four base. But nobody could know that. Okay, and I, I'm not the only one who knew it when I figured it out or God helped me figure it out. But anyway, now we know every nation on the planet. And he says here that a nation that thou knowest not is going to eat up all your stuff. We learned this part, part of that. We learned a little bit in Sunday school. God called these locusts a nation. So then he says... Um, oh, look at verse 36. The Lord shall bring thee and thy king, which thou shalt set over thee, unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And there thou shalt serve other gods, wood and stone. Look at verse 43. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. Um, let me get to it. Look at verse... Uh, 49 the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far 
Now, is this nation for us or against us? And we know the difference because Christ is for us. If God be for us, who can be against us? The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth. A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. A nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person or show favor to the young. And so on and so on. There's more than one place where this is mentioned. And I will, as we get into that, I will, I will take you in that direction. Plainly put, and I have a whole teaching on this. I've done it years ago. I'll probably dig it back up again. But from everything that I could see, and remember, I was open to it all. When God said, I'm going to teach you things, I'm like, God, I will wipe my mind clean and you tell me what to do. Um, I, I discerned from the scriptures that God was a God of knowledge, knowing things. That when the Spirit comes on us, he, the, it's the Spirit of knowledge. That's one of the seven spirits of God. Three of them are knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. There's nothing in the seven spirits of God about mystery tongues. Nothing in there about it. Nothing at all. Everything I could discern from Scripture and the, the very first uh, like thing I did at Reg Kelly's church in 2000 was the Holy Bible, a sure word of prophecy. And I just went line upon line, Scripture upon Scripture, showing that God intends for us to know what this Bible is saying, what it's telling us, what it's teaching. God is a God of knowledge. The Spirit of God is a spirit of knowledge, spirit of understanding, a spirit of wisdom. There's nothing in the Bible that tells me that the Spirit comes over a person and He says things unknown to him and to everybody else. It goes against what Paul then says in that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 14, that when a man speak, if a man speak in a, in a tongue, that was the words he used. He omitted unknown. I, I caught that. If a man speak in a tongue, let it be by two or at the most three and let one interpret. Because God said, I'm not going to leave a service where somebody spoke in a tongue and everybody else is like, what in the world did he say? I'm going to have someone stand up and inter I'm going to give them the interpretation, but I'm going to have somebody, I'm, everybody in that church is going to know what those men said. That is a God and a spirit of knowledge, knowing. But now we have a man who comes in and he speaks in an un known tongue and he's not speaking men God understands it no man understandeth him that's what it says does it say that eventually they'll understand it or if he inter interprets it he'll understand it he doesn't say that he says no man understandeth him how be it in the spirit what does he speak mysteries what's her first name mystery he's speaking things that nobody can understand now again I may be way out in outer space on this one pretty much am okay but you now I'm giving you a couple weeks to look at it I'm giving you a couple weeks to look at it okay and you folks out there no I'm the one out there you're anyway let's stand and he says again verse 4 he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself now what did what did Paul do Paul edified himself he edified everybody else and I caught that too. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. See, he's telling you there's a difference. So, I mean, how, let's, how would you deal with it if a man came in here, an unknown man, 
and speaking in an unknown language and none of us knew it. How would you re and and you know you you kind of get the idea that he's here to override the preaching. How would you respond to it? Chris Chris is reaching. I saw him. I was looking right at him. He's going, I'm reaching, man. You better reach for something else. <laughs> he said it won't work. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you and we thank you, God, for uh, this night. Lord, there are things that we just, we just don't know because we can't see them yet. But Lord, we ask you, God, that you just simply prepare us for days that are coming. We don't have to understand everything in the Bible, but God, we just believe it. We believe what it says. And Lord, we just pray, God, that on things we don't understand, that you give us light or you give us grace. And thank you, God. We love you. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.